All right, so chapter 21, which is on occlusal and localization techniques. This is found on page 228 in your book. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to define the key terms associated with occlusal and localization techniques. You should be able to describe the purpose of occlusal examination, list the uses of occlusal examination, and discuss the basic principles involved. Discuss or I'm sorry, describe the patient and equipment preparations that are necessary before using the occlusal technique and state the recommended vertical angulations for the following maxillary occlusal projections, topographic, lateral, right or left, and pediatric. You should be able to state the recommended vertical angulation for the following mandibular occlusal projections of topographic, cross-sectional, and pediatric. State the purpose of localization techniques and their uses. Describe the buckle object rule. Describe the right angle technique. List the patient and equipment preparations that are necessary before using the buckle object rule or the right angle technique. And lastly, you should be able to describe the receptor placements for the buccal object rule and compare the resulting images and describe receptor placements for the right angle technique and compare the resulting images. All right, so why are we doing this? We need to be able to present the basic concepts of both the um, occlusal and the localization techniques. And we need you to be able to understand how to get your patient ready, how to set up your equipment, uh, the film placement procedures, for both the occlusal technique and for localization techniques. Um, these are in addition to mastering the periapical and the interproximal examinations. It's important to be able to understand these sort of accessory uh, examinations. That way you're able to um, become quite an asset to your dental team and being able to get radiographs that maybe other radiographers are less comfortable getting. So. So the occlusal technique is used to examine large areas of the maxilla or the mandible. We've talked about this a little bit in the past as far as um, why you would definitely not use these, right? We're definitely not going to use these for bone level or for cavities, right? Those are two big things that we look for in a dental office, but they're certainly not things we would use the occlusal technique for. Um, and it's named the occlusal technique because of the way the patient bites down or occludes on the whole receptor. Okay, so the occlusal surface, as you know from dental anatomy, is the chewing surface of your posterior teeth. In the anterior, that biting surface is termed the incisal edge, right? Um, for the purpose of the occlusal technique, uh, the biting surface is the biting surface that we're talking about because the patient occludes or bites down on the receptor. The occlusal examination is the type of radiographic examination used to inspect that large area of the maxilla or the mandible on one image. The occlusal technique is the method that we use to expose that receptor in the occlusal examination. The occlusal receptor is any type of receptor that we use in our occlusal technique. Typically, the recommended size for an adult is a size four. A size four is about three by 2.25 inches in dimension. Um, it is quite a large receptor. You'll see in some of the pictures that uh, they look a little funny, kind of putting those in there. On a child, the recommended size is a size two. Okay, so the occlusal technique and the occlusal radiograph is a supplemental imaging technique that is always used in conjunction with the periapical or the bite wing. We don't typically do this in place of periapicals and bite wings. Those come first, and then if we need to see something extra, then we use the occlusal. Um, so it's used whenever large areas of the maxilla or the mandible have to be visualized, um, or if the whatever we're looking at is too large for the periapical or maybe the receptor for the periapical is too difficult for the patient to uh, handle. Maybe you have a small child and they can't uh, quite determine whether or not um, a tooth is present or um, you know they can't handle the periapical images. So then you do an occlusal radiograph on them. We are looking for the following things. Now, this does get into a little bit more than what you might see in your day-to-day -day general practice, but um, 
the number one thing you're looking for are for teeth, unerupted or impacted teeth that we aren't able to capture in our periapical. Maybe we can't see the whole tooth in our periapical uh, radiograph, and so then we would use our occlusal. The other things we might look for are retained roots or extracted the retained roots of extracted teeth. We are, might look to locate foreign bodies of the maxilla or the mandible. Um, there are times when you know fillings are uh, being removed and part of the amalgam actually uh, flings off and embeds itself or it gets down into maybe a socket and it heals that way. And so we need to be able to see where it is. Um, we might be looking for salivary stones in the duct of the submandibular gland. This one's pretty common. Uh, we can locate and evaluate the extent of lesions like cysts, tumors, malignancies in the maxilla or the mandible. Um, these are a, a lot of the time we're looking at lesions. And if you're not able to see the whole lesion, lesion on a periapical or a bite wing, then we might turn to the occlusal. Um, we might be looking to evaluate the boundaries of the maxillary sinus if that patient is having uh, an extraction in the maxillary teeth. The maxillary molars sometimes will communicate with the sinus, and so the, the dentist might be uh, wanting to make sure that the maxillary sinus won't be in the way. Um, to evaluate fractures of the maxilla or the mandible uh, of, the, of the alveolar bone, not the teeth of the maxilla or mandible to aid in the examination of patients who cannot open their mouths more than a few millimeters. So this is where that really comes into the, the placement for the receptors. It's too difficult for the patient. Um, to examine the area of a cleft palate, um, you know, either before or after surgery, that might be important to make sure that the, the bone of the cleft palate is, is um, sufficient for either to have surgery or is healing properly. And then to measure changes in the size and shape of the maxilla or mandible, this is more so for, um, for children as they grow. We might want to make sure that we understand the size and shape so that whether they have enough room for their, um, their teeth that are going to grow in. Um, this might be done kind of in a, in a series of radiographs. Maybe the, the uh, orthodontist takes one at the beginning of treatment and then the patient gets a palatal expander and then, um, you know, later, maybe a year later, they do another x-ray to make sure that the, the palate is sufficiently expanded. So that's... Um, those are some of the main reasons, um, at, at some of the only reasons that you would probably use them. Most of them are not something that you're seeing all of the time in general practice, but if you work for um, some of those specialties or you know, every so often, um, you'll get someone who has a case like this. All right, and so the main principle for taking the occlusal radiograph or the occlusal technique is that the receptor is placed with the tube side or the side that faces the tube head um, facing the arch that is being exposed. So if I want the mandibular uh, occlusal radiograph, then I'm going to place the film in with the white side facing down or if I'm using my sensor, I would place it in where the flat side is facing down and that cord is on top. And then the receptor is placed in between the two, the two arches, right? And then when the patient closes down, their arch or their bite will hold the receptor in place. So the receptor is stabilized when the patient bites on that surface of the receptor. And just like I told you guys when we were talking about bite wings, where I don't say the word bite to my patients because you know, last thing I want is for them to bite me. So I always say close gently. And this is another time where you're gonna really wanna say close gently because if they bite down super hard on the receptor, they're going to leave bite marks on the film especially. Uh, on the sensor, you don't want them to scratch it with their with their teeth, right? So you want them to bite very gently, just enough to hold the receptor in place and enough for it to not move as you're, you know, moving them around in order to get that proper uh, radiograph. Okay, so first things first, we always get our patient ready, right? We tell them what we're going to be doing. We tell them why we're going to be taking these types of x-rays. We get that informed consent from them. And then we get them in the chair, get them all ready to go, got their lead apron on, all that jazz. And then uh, we get our equipment ready next. And so we make sure, typically, you, I mean, you have your equipment ready at the same time. But anyway, um, 
you would get all of your equipment ready as far as uh, the RIN instruments you would use, which you don't use for an occlusal. So as long as you have the sensor, it's properly wrapped. Uh, you have the infection control, um, you know, equipment that you need lined up. So if it's a, if you're taking film, you have your cup with you, or you have a, maybe a paper towel to put it on. If you're taking digital, you've got your sensor in a sleeve and uh, you've got your computer pulled up, all that stuff then you'll use either your maxillary occlusal projections which include your topographic lateral right or left and the pediatric projection and then um, the mandibular occlusal projections also include your topographic the cross-sectional which we'll talk a bit more about the pediatric projection as well and then we're going to go over the vertical angulation that we will use for each of these techniques okay so first up patient preparation we get our um, we explain it to our patient, we get informed consent. We adjust the chair so that the patient is upright. And the level of the chair is at a comfortable working height for us, okay? If we're too tall, we wanna bring the chair up. If we're short, like me, then you're gonna bring the chair, well, you're just gonna have it low. You're gonna adjust the headrest to support and position your patient's head. Now, in this one, it does talk about having your patients lined up, but there are ways, because sometimes, you know, the patient has a small neck or the lead apron is taking up some room, and so this one, you might actually have your patient lean their head back or tilt their head down a little bit in order for you to be able to reach the area the best that you can. And so for this one, just make sure that the, the headrest is in a place where the patient can move their head around a little bit for you um, and just keep that in mind. Then you put the lead apron on them, the thyroid collar nice and secure all the way up against the neck. Then you request that your patient remove eyeglasses or any other objects inside the mouth. And so you'll have them take out their partial. Um, you'll have them uh, remove any jewelry, like from the, the collarbone up. Um, necklaces are usually okay because they're covered by the, the lead apron. Um, but any kind of like nose rings or uh, large hoop earrings, things like that, something that might get in the way, something that might potentially... Um, um, you know, be in the image. That are, Those are the kinds of things you're going to need to remove. Most of the time, glasses, especially if you're taking maxillary ones, you're going to need to make sure that, that um, they take off their glasses. Um, the book does recommend that your occlusal plane is parallel to the floor. So when you start out with that headrest, you're going to want them parallel. And then if you need them to move, then you can ask them to. Um, and then always, always, always make sure that they bite gently on the receptor. Okay, so then the next up is our equipment preparation. Um, now, typically in our clinic, you set up the equipment and then you bring your patient in and get them ready, um, but you would have gotten consent before. So both of these kind of happen sort of simultaneously. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have your exposure control factors on the machine um, at the recommended um, level. And so on our tube head or on our control panel, you're able to choose the occlusal uh, little image. It's right underneath the bite wing one. And so make sure when you're taking an occlusal radiograph on any of your patients, which you'll have to do as a part of your uh, clinic requirements, <clears throat> that you will choose the occlusal uh, it, like exposure time. Now that's going to be important because the exposure for an entire occlusal radiograph will be more exposure time than you'll get for a bite wing. Okay, so if you don't change the setting, your image is probably going to be too light. And then your book talks about either the 8-inch or the 16-inch positioning indicating device can be used. It really doesn't, doesn't make that big of a difference as long as you set up your exposures uh, correctly. Okay, so first up is the maxillary occlusal projections. And if you turn to page 230 in your book, you'll see that first one, the maxillary topographic occlusal projection. And in this one, we are trying to see the entire arch of the maxillary teeth. You can see here that this patient has um, the canine uh, kind of in a, a weird position there. And so without this radiograph, we might not be able to see the full extent of that tooth. We, in a periapical, we might only see, you know, the bottom portion of that canine that is unerupted. And so here with our occluso, we're able to catch the whole root and see exactly where that tooth is in relation to the sinus and all of those other bones. Um, another thing I want to point out here is that you can see in the figure C, 
there's a cone cut on this image, right? There has to be a cone cut because the PID at its widest is only ever 2.75 inches. That is the largest that it is. But the size 4 film is 3 by 2.25, right? So we know that because the film is wider at one on one, you know, dimension, either height or width, depending on, you know, how you want to think about it, um, we know that at some point on our occlusal, there, if we're using a size four, that there is going to be a cone cut. And so in this image, that cone cut is not an error as long as it doesn't cut off any of the anatomic surfaces that we're looking at. Then um, if you go to the next page, 231, we have the lateral or the right or left projections. And it's used to examine the palatal roots of the molar teeth. And you can see here in this radiograph where I don't see all three roots of my mandibular molars. I only see the palatal root. And this might be very um, informative if one of the teeth in my palatal root has a lesion on it but I'm not sure which one, because when I take a periapical, I might just see some type of large radiolucency around that uh, the, those roots together. And so without having this occlusal radiograph, I wouldn't be able to tell around the palatal root. Um, and then the next one, if you'll turn the page again, 232, there is the pediatric one. This one is pretty common for pediatric, um, for kiddos, because we want to make sure that the the children have the teeth that are supposed to grow in. And so it's typically used in children who are five or younger because at around six is when the teeth that are you know supposed to fall out and then the, the central incisors grow in. I know you guys got that chart in dental, um, dental anatomy as far as the sequence of teeth that grow in. I think it's in chapter one of that other book. But anyway, um, you can see here how I can see both my centrals and I can see my two laterals. Sometimes there will be congenitally missing teeth in this area. And so um, we might take this x-ray to make sure that all of the teeth that are supposed to grow in are present. And if we notice in this radiograph that there is a congenitally missing lateral, or maybe this patient has peg laterals, then we can prepare our patient's parents for those issues as they come up and they know not to you know be waiting for five years for a lateral to grow in because it's it's never going to um, this is also important in order to kind of link your patients up with an orthodontist so if we took this occlusal radiograph your patient has congenitally missing um, laterals we might want to get that patient over to an orthodontist sooner so that they can, you know, kind of coordinate treatment and make sure that the space is left for the laterals so that the teeth that grow in don't move into that area so that um, when they do restorative treatment, maybe they give the patient implants or, um, you know, maybe they do like some sort of bridge of some kind. Um, when they do that treatment, there'll be room for those teeth. All right, and so then for the mandibular teeth, the projections we have here are the topographic, which are used to examine the anterior teeth of the mandible. If you're on page 233, you'll be able to see those anterior teeth really well. See how here we also, we wouldn't be able to use any kind of diagnostic um, imaging for the posterior teeth of the mandibular uh, because they're they're so overlapped on each other. But the mandibular, or the, the anterior teeth, we can see fairly well. Um, this is, there's a certain amount of distortion here, right? Like those teeth are not that actually that long. Um, so we need to keep that in mind that we're not using this to measure for bone level. We're just using this to be able to see those teeth and how they are, uh, how they're positioned. Again, if there were was a tooth missing or there was a tooth that was kind of laying sideways and impacted, unable to grow in, then we would be able to tell really easily from these. It's a lot less common in our mandibular teeth to have a tooth that gets impacted that way. You know, we have less of a peg laterals, we have less of the congenitally missing of the anterior mandibular teeth, but you know, just in case if there was something crazy going on, we would be able to tell. The next one is the cross-sectional projection. If you turn the page to 234, you'll be able to see um, really nicely each of those teeth as they're in the arch. And then that space, that submandibular space, um, is, is very easy to tell if that patient were to have some type of foreign body or a salivary stone in the floor of the mouth, then we would be able to tell really easily 
in that very dark area in the center that you know something's missing again you can see that cone cut right along the edges which is it's in the right place so we don't have to worry about that then the pediatric projection if you turn to 235 those are the ones that we're looking for for the kiddos to make sure that all of the teeth that are supposed to grow in will be able to all right so here are the vertical angulations for these um, for the I know this is everybody's favorite part. This table for table 21-2 uh, is found on page 229 at the very bottom on the right. And these are the angulations that we're gonna use for each of these types of radiographs. So for the occlusal uh, projection of the, the maxillary topographic, um, then we're gonna be using plus 65. You can see the image there um, in image A, we have that 65 degree angle because look at all of the other uh, things that would get in the way. If we tried to make this 90 and we were trying to come in this way, we would be you know, having way too much overlap with all of the other things like the orbit and, and all of that. So we have to come in at this 65 degree angle in order to bypass all of these other um, structures. And then let's go on to the next. All right, and so then for the maxillary lateral occlusal projection, either right or left, our vertical angulation is a 60 degree angle. And you can see that here um, in B, how we are at about a 60 degree angle. It looks like we're gonna capture his eyeball, <laughs> but we're not. We're just gonna be able to see this stuff on the very bottom here. All right, and then for the maxillary pediatric occlusal projection, we're gonna be, again, using a 60 degree plus 60 degrees here. I wish that there was a good picture for this because it really feels like you're kind of just setting your cone right on their nose, but um, you end up getting this really nice image right here in B whenever you, you place this up. So don't be afraid that it looks like they're, you know, you're gonna, capture their nose or you're gonna you know do it, it feels like it's too much angulation um, don't worry about that because typically the the image comes out pretty good okay so then here is our vertical angulation for the mandibular topographic and this one is a negative 55 degrees we are almost as much angulation as we are at the top however those lower uh, anterior teeth don't have as much of a lean to them right they don't lean out as far as our maxillary anterior teeth do and so this is why we have a negative 55 instead of a negative 60. Um, and you can see here how you get a very nice, if you, you line it up right even with that patient's midline and the very center of the image should be right here at the midline, okay? All right, so then here is the mandibular cross-sectional. And it's cross-sectional because here is the occlusal plane, right? And then we come in exactly perpendicular at a 90 degree angle to the occlusal plane. This is the one I was telling you about where sometimes you have to have your patient either lean back or look down for you. Well, this one, they're gonna have to really lean back in order for you to be able to get that tube head um, at a 90 degree angle to that receptor. And so don't be afraid to say, you know, look up. No, look up more. <laughs> um, so you want to be at that 90 degree angle in order to get all of this really nice uh, black space right here to be able to tell if that patient has any type of lesions or salivary stones or things like that. Okay, so then here is that mandibular pediatric occlusal uh, projection and again we're using that negative 55 because the anterior teeth don't lean out as far and we want to reduce the amount of distortion as much as we can um, so then you were using the 55 on a kiddo you might still have them lean back just a little bit because their chest areas usually uh, kind of inhibits you being able to kind of get the tube head in where you want it um, so don't be afraid you know to have your patient lean back or, or um, do that if you do have your patient lean back then that means Means you're going to need to change your vertical angulation so if you have the occlusal plane um, at you know parallel to the floor then you're using negative 55 but if you lean your patient back then you're going to want to stay at a 55 degree angle to the occlusal plane okay so don't get confused with that whenever you're taking these and you're wondering why your negative 55 is um, you know insufficient or it's too much angulation um, you're, you're going at 55 degree 55 degrees off of where the occlusal plane is. And if you're having a hard time as far as visualizing that, then just have your patients stay, you know, looking parallel.
Okay, so next up is localization techniques, and you'll find this on page 236 in your book. You'll see it starts with basic concepts. Um, localization is a method that we use to locate the position of a tooth or an object that is located in the jaws. Now, this is probably my favorite aspect of radiographs because you get to be kind of a detective and you get to figure out where things are in relation to, you know, how you took your images, how you took your radiographs. And so in order to do this, you need a thorough understanding of the basic concepts and you need to understand step by step how to figure out where those objects are. And um, we're going to get into this a little bit more, but it's important to remember that we are we have two dimensional pictures of three dimensional objects. And so there is an element that depth that we're not getting in our images. OK, and so it's important to keep that in mind that when we see something on a radiograph, it's not necessarily exactly where we see it. Either it's closer to us or it's further away than maybe we're expecting. Okay, so the purpose and the use. Why would we do localization techniques? Well, we need to remember that the dental image is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object, and therefore it does not depict the depth of an object. So we're going to use these localization techniques in order to figure out how far away or how close the object is inside that image. Okay, so the things that we might be trying to localize would be maybe a foreign body, like a shrapnel or um, some other type of, of your thing that the patient has in their mouth that gets kind of jammed into places. Uh, and then impacted teeth or unerupted teeth. I know you guys are learning the difference in your dental anatomy class, but impacted teeth are teeth that cannot grow in because they've run into some other type of structure. And unerupted teeth are just teeth that haven't yet erupted, but they still can. Then retained roots are things maybe the patient uh, had an extraction and part of the root broke off, or maybe uh, the tooth broke and they you know didn't have it replaced or didn't have it removed, and so the root is still retained inside the mouth. And then uh, root positions are maybe the patient has a, like a dilaceration of some kind and we want to know uh, where those roots are. The salivary stones, which we talked about when we talked about the, uh, the cross-sectional uh, image. And so if there are salivary stones, we need to know exactly where they are in order to remove them. Um, and then jaw fractures, we might be able to see broken needles and instruments. Um, you probably don't think this will ever happen to you, but uh, broken needles do happen all the time, especially, you know, when Texas is going to be able to um, begin doing local, local anesthetic. This is something we're going to need to be able to, to keep in mind. And then instruments. Uh, instruments, once they've been over sharpened, their, their tips are too narrow, they break a little bit more easily. And so it's important to keep in mind that this could happen to you. An instrument could break off inside the sulcus or inside the mouth, and you need to be able to find it. And then dental restorative materials, this is, they're talking about maybe amalgam or gutta percha or things like that, where the, the material is placed inside the mouth, either in a socket or in a root. And um, we need to be able to know exactly where that's at. All right, the first step of the localization techniques is the buccal object rule. You will probably see this on your board exam. I know I certainly saw it on my board exam. They will show you two images and you're going to have to figure out uh, whatever it is they're pointing at. You're going to have to figure out if it's uh, lingual or if it's buccal. And so this buccal object rule governs the orientation of structures portrayed in two images exposed at different angles. We'll talk about this more. So one periapical or one bite wing is exposed using the proper technique and angulation. And then once we see that there is an object of some kind, we then take a second periapical or a second bite wing exposed in a changing changing the direction either we move more mesial or we move distally and then in order then we use that second image to compare to our first image after the first one is taken a different horizontal or vertical angulation is used and after both images are exposed and processed then they're compared to each other okay so then um, once you see both of the images, then the, the dental structures and the object are seen in the second image, it will have appeared to either moved. And either it moves in the same direction as we moved our PID, or it's going to have moved in an opposite direction. If we, we took our first bite wing and we saw the image, then we took our second bite wing by moving the PID distal, and the object moved distal, then it's the object is on the lingual aspect. 
if when we moved distal, the object appears to have moved mesial, then it is on the buckle, okay? And we're gonna use a really great mnemonic to remember this forever. All right, and so the mnemonic is called SLOB. We're going to, I talk about it all the time as the SLOB rule. And we use it as if the object moves the same direction as our PID moved, so if we move distal, the object moves distal, then it's on the lingual. If our PID goes distal, but the object goes the opposite direction, so it goes mesial when we moved distal, then the object is on the buckle, okay? So same lingual, opposite buckle is the slob rule. You will probably see this on your board exam, and I know I did, and uh, it's very important in the localization technique because a lot of the time when there's an object, you're already taking two bite wings, right? You're already taking two PAs in that area. And so if a, a lot of times with the buckle object rule, you know, you don't first see the object and then you have to go set up all of your stuff again and then take a second. Most of the time it comes up in an image that you already have two, two x-rays of. And so you're kind of able to use this one automatically without having to go back and take another radiograph. So keep that in mind, slob rule is same lingual opposite buckle. Okay, so here is an image that is sort of like trying to help you understand how the, the slob rule works. So if I have an A, I have my x-ray beam pointing straight at these two dots, and my blue is a buckle object, and my, the I guess like a navy blue, or maybe it's a black, I don't know how it looks on your screen, is on the lingual aspect. I take this radiograph with my x-ray beam straight on with both of those two objects, and in my image, it looks like they overlap one another, right? I can't see the blue one at all because it's being covered up by the black. Then on the bottom one, see how my x-ray beam has shifted forward or it's shifted mesially, right? This is how I'm able to tell where my objects are. So in B, um, if my, ob my x-ray beam moved mesial, it looks like in that image, that black dot also moved mesial. Okay, can you see how before it was in between my two premolars and now it's in between my two, my canine and my first premolar? It looks like when my beam moved forward, my black dot moved forward too. And so that tells me if it moved the same direction, because both of them did, they both moved mesial, that it's on the lingual aspect, right? Same lingual. Now for my blue dot, I, I couldn't really see it that great in the one, but that's okay, I know it's there. So in A, my blue dot is between my two premolars, but then when I moved my x-ray beam mesial, it looks like my blue dot moved distal, right? Because now it's in between the second premolar and the first molar. So if it moved the opposite direction as my beam, because my beam moved mesial and my dot moved distal, it moved the opposite direction, which means it's buckle, opposite buckle, okay? Okay, so then here is the other technique for localization, the right angle technique. It's just another rule for the orientation seen on those images. One periapical receptor is exposed using the proper technique and angulation to show the position of an object in the superior and inferior and the anterior posterior relationship, right? Basically what that means is it shows us how high up or down the image is. Maybe it's closer to the incisal or it's closer to the, the periapical, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the apical of the tooth, right? The, the, how tall the tooth is. And then it also shows us, is it toward the mesial or is it toward the distal, right? Those are the only two aspects that our, our normal radiographs can show us. And then we take an occlusal receptor. Um, and now typically we do this for the mandibular teeth, more so for the maxillary ones. And we're going to use that cross-sectional um, uh, occlusal technique. And so in doing that, we're using our 90 degree angle and we're going to do the occlusal image and then with that, we're going to be able to see where the, where the object is in dimension, either is it more buccal or is it more lingual. And so then we take those two images together in order to locate where the object is in all three of those dimensions, okay? All right, so then that one looks like this. First is our, this looks like our uh, premolar PA right here, and we can see that the object is 
in between the canine and the first premolar, and we can see that it's about midway between, you know, where the CEJ of the tooth is and the apex. Well, on the premolar, on the the canine is a little longer. So then we know the object is there, and then we come in and we take our occlusal or our cross-sectional radiograph, and we're able to tell that this object is on the lingual and that it's a good distance in, right? So this is probably a salivary stone kind of location. Uh, I like this about the right angle because it's so very straightforward. There's no mnemonic that you have to remember. The only problem with this one is that if it's on the maxillary, it can sometimes be pretty difficult to figure out um, to, to use this one. So this is great for mandibular uh, ones, great for mandibular objects, but not necessarily great for maxillary objects. Uh, you can see another example of this one on 239, that image in figure 21-12. And you can see here how there's that, uh, looks like an amalgam or very bright white uh, sort of, of uh, object in the periapical, and then when you come down to the uh, the occlusal image on bottom, using that right angle technique, you can see that the object was clearly on the buccal surface of those teeth. All right, so for our step-by-step -step procedures, first up, we need to get our patients ready. We need to let them know, hey, we're going to be taking x-rays this way. We're going to be using these types of x-rays. We're going to be, you know, doing it for this reason. Uh, we get their informed consent, and then we're going to need to figure out, do we want to do the buckle object rule, or do we do the right angle technique? Um, and so here, once we see in the first image, the first you know, normal radiograph that we take, that is when we have to make this decision. Do we use the buckle object rule or do we use the right angle technique? All right, and so the slides would like for me to, to remind you from our earlier chapters and from our equipment preparations that we explain the procedure to the patient, we adjust the chair, we adjust our headrest, we make sure that the lead apron is on properly, and we ask them to remove any glasses or objects or, uh, you know, what have you, piercings. Then we exp we discuss the equipment preparations um, as far as, you know, having all of your equipment set up. If you're, you know, using the occlusal technique, um, then you, the right angle technique, then you're going to set up for an occlusal. So you're going to need a size four receptor. If you are using the slob rule or the buckle object rule, then you're going to use the same receptor you took for the, the original one, right? And then uh, you're going to make sure your exposure settings are changed. Either, you know, you're taking another bite wing or another PA, or you're using an occlusal. So you're going to have to change your, your control panel around, right? And then uh, we're going to need to make sure we understand the, uh, the, angles that we're going to use. So if we're using the uh, slob rule or the buckle object rule, then we're going to be moving distal. We're going to be changing our horizontal angulation. But if you know we're changing over completely and we're doing an occlusal radiograph, then we need to know our angles for that occlusal radiograph. So keep that in mind as, as you decide which uh, localization technique you're going to use because that will play a very big role in the equipment and the positioning of your patient and all of those other things that happen after. All right, so here, if you look at figure 21-10, it's on page 238. Uh, in the very top image A, you can see that this was a molar projection, a molar PA. It's not a great molar PA because it's too anterior. But anyway, um, you can see that the first premolar there has two roots worth of gutta percha. And so we know that that tooth had been seen by an antodontist, and we know that the first uh, maxillary premolar does have two roots. But but we want to make sure that it's filled properly. And so we would then, so our first one is to expose the molar just like it should be, except this isn't proper technique. Anyway, um, then we would shift our PID more mesial and we would take a second uh, image. And you can see that in B, that once we have shifted more mesially, we're able to see that the root, um, the, the second root worth of gutta percha has actually been tucked now behind um, that area. And so one of the roots moved forward with our, the, the mesial, I'm sorry, the more uh, buccal root has shifted buccal with us or mesial with us. And then the other root, the lingual root has shifted back and it's shifted the opposite side. So we know that those two roots that we're looking at, those two 
um, root canals worth of gutta percha, we know that one moved forward, one moved the same direction, and one moved the opposite direction, which tells us that those two filled canals worth of gutta percha are in a buccal and lingual orientation. All right, and then here, if we are trying to determine the location of an impacted supernumerary tooth or an extra tooth, then we might again use our buccal object rule. And in this one, we would position the patient with the maxillary arch parallel to the floor. We expose one central lateral incisor periapical. Uh, you can see this on um, figure 21-11. It's on page 238. You can see the you would place the, the central lateral incisor periapical using the proper technique, and then you shift the PID in a distal direction, and you take it again, and then in the second image, once the PID is moved, then you get to see that the impacted tooth moved in the same direction. That little area up at the top, that is like a tooth bud. It, I know it doesn't look like a tooth, but anyway. Okay, and then for this one, this one we're going to be using figure 21-12. It is uh, the same one we were talking about in that other slide. It's where we can use, uh, it's what we can use, the right angle technique to determine the position of the foreign object that is, is very radiopaque. And with this one, we would take our normal uh, PA, we would position the patient with the maxillary arch parallel to the floor, expose one periapical receptor using the proper technique and angulation, uh, I mean, it's okay. It's It's got a little bit of elongation, but it's fine. And then we would expose an occlusal receptor because we see that very radiopaque object there. And we want to know, is that radiopaque object on the buccal or is it on the lingual of those teeth? And we don't know without being able to see the depth, right? So then we come in and we take a right angle uh occlusal technique or the cross-sectional mandibular occlusal technique and we are able to see very clearly in that bottom image that the the foreign object is on the buccal aspect of those teeth all right so then if you turn the page to 240 in figure 21-13 you're able to see in those two molar uh images that it looks like there is a small radiopaque uh object right there next to the um the distal root of the first mandibular molar. And so uh, we originally, we would have taken the maxillary arch parallel to the floor, uh, periapical image of that tooth. Then we shift the PID in a mesial direction, exposing a second periapical image. And you can see that it uh, doesn't move that much, right? So we, we're not, we're still, even though we took two, they, I mean, I don't, I don't think they shifted too much. Uh, I, I don't know what they did here between A and B because it's those are like exactly the same image. But anyway, they say that they shifted. So good for them. But they I don't think they really did. And then in order to confirm the location of the radiopaque artifact, then they then switched over to taking a mandibular cross sectional projection, which you see in C. And then here they were able to figure out where that little a piece of wire is. It turns out it was an orthodontic wire, like a little piece had broken off and it gotten lodged in the tissue. And so then you can see in D, they they are kind of pointing out exactly where it is and then they point out exactly where it is uh, as far as the tissue goes. And then there you can see that they, they removed it. And so um, this is, I guess, an, a good example of how sometimes maybe the slob rule wouldn't work quite as well as the uh, right angle technique. And so it's, it's important that you keep in mind, you know, that um, each technique is going to be, you know, it, in individual cases, one technique will be better than another. Okay, so just like always, if you have questions, please either put them in the question and answer discussion board that is always available to you, or you can send me an email, um, or you can wait until you see me in lab and we can talk about this there. Um, for this chapter specifically, I think that it would be really important for you to do the chapters uh, questions that are in the back of, of chapter 21. They'll start on page 241. Um, I mean, you don't necessarily have to do them and turn them in. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but I do, I do think that trying to figure out exactly, you know, what they mean when they talk about the slob rule and looking at the two images and trying to figure out is that foreign object, whatever they're pointing out, is it buccal or is it lingual? Okay, I think that it's going to be very beneficial to you to be able to conceptualize uh, those those techniques.